Any anyone from the public on Andrew? Uh, let's see. There is uh, a Sarah, forgive me, can't pronounce the last name. Um, if anybody is here for public comment, they could just raise your digital hand. I see none. Okay. I'll pull this back up. Oh, forgive me. Hold on, Jay. We do have uh, Jane Mann has her hand raised. Andrew, okay. can we elevate Jane yep. for public comment? Hi, Jane. Hello. Hey, welcome. Thank you. What can we answer a question for you? Or do you have a comment? Oh, well, I don't have a question. I just got on. It's the first time that I've come to one of your meetings, and I want to just let you know that I was here because my picture doesn't show. Okay. Thank you. And I think there will be other people, so you might want to also tell them to raise their hand. Yeah, we, uh, we, we did, Jane. Okay, let me pull up, uh, Jay, let me pull up the uh, agenda, which I had, I had ready, forgive me. So do we want to edit, make notes on the meeting minutes, or do we want to skip them for next week? Well, I, I don't know what everybody else thought. I had, I just had one edit I, I'd like to propose anyway on the minutes of the 27th, which um, are very detailed at the very end of the minutes, or almost the very end, it was section five, Springtown meeting. Um, we're talking about Morocco here, it says there was a debt exclusion override for approximately $30 million for renewal and replacement costs for Morocco. But because of the commitment to replace the building, there was support from the school committee, the select board and town meeting to identify 3.6 million in scope for the life extension plan. So the beginning of that sentence, Don and Frida, it should actually read, we, we currently carry nearly $30 million in renewal and replacement costs for Morocco, comma. Okay. And then the rest of the sentence is fine. Is, is that what you sent me? I, I didn't get a chance to look at your comment. No, but... I haven't. I, I haven't even sent that to you because I was actually working backwards. So I just caught okay. that before the meeting started. In other okay. words, we, we, we have nearly $30 million in renewal and replacement needs at Morocco, but oh, rather okay. than raise that money and spend the money, yeah. The ballot question was just for 3.6 million for the urgent and critical needs to extend the life of the building. Everything else looks totally fine, but okay. um, right. but we did not have a debt exclusion, you know, for 30 million dollars. So okay, that's uh, fine. Yeah, that that's my only proposal on the minutes of the 27th, and otherwise, okay. I think they look great. Thank you for your data. Thanks. Can we get a motion to approve then. Can I move to approve the minutes of the 27th as amended? Second. Well, I'd add a couple comments um, to Don. Uh, okay. They were particularly important. I knit you, already sent, you already sent them, Brian? Yeah, earlier today. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so, okay. I, I just didn't get a chance to, to to catch them. I'm just coming on to my email this afternoon. So I'll go ahead. And, uh, I, is it something we need to discuss or is it just uh, something that's pretty straightforward that we can? Mine works pretty straightforward, okay. I think. Then I'll just incorporate them in, into the minutes. Okay. So that was on the 27th or on March 6th? I had a couple comments on both. Okay. So then maybe change your, whoever made the motion, change it to uh, approve the minutes as amended, uh, both of them, March 6th and February 27th. Well, I was actually going to request, Don, if we could just hold off on the minutes of the 6th, because I hadn't, I, I had other comments beyond what I sent you, but okay, if it suits sorry. Vivian, you know, we, the minutes we approved tonight can certainly go to the MSBA. The other minutes can go as a draft document, and then we just, in our next meeting, we can approve, All right, you know, fine. the minutes of the 6th and tonight, too, because they always like to have updated minutes, if, if that's okay with everybody. That works for Vivian. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I have no problem with that. So I think I think the, the minutes of the 27th as amended, I think are are good. They're, they're, we t covered a lot of stuff. So it was a lot of work that went into that. I appreciate it. Okay. Okay. So we have a motion and a second on the 27th. All right. Frank is not on yet. So. Yep, I am Jay. Oh, I, uh, okay. 
Yes. And Lisa is on now. Okay. So, uh, Frank, do you approve? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Brian? Yes. Yes. Uh, is Todd on yet? Yes. Todd? Yes. yes. Right. Geetha? Did we lose Geith? Geetha? Do you approve? I said yes. Okay. Sorry. John? Yes. Colleen? Yes. Uh, Mark? Uh, Stain. I wasn't there. Okay. Correct. Uh, John Miller is not on. Correct. Uh, Don? Yes. And Emily? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. They're high school. Uh, no high school. All no right. High school. And mm -hmm. Lynch Elementary. Uh, swing space. Um, so I can give a brief update. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the filed submit opening is this Wednesday for the interior work. And um, so Wednesday, I believe it's 10 a.m. Um, and the general bids are still scheduled for April 6th. Um, right now, we only have two generals, it looks like, that have pulled the plan, so hopefully. <laughs> I thought, Chris, earlier when we talked that a couple of them were generals, but I looked them up and they're not. They're, they were specialties, so um, so it's still, there's still, like, you know, a little bit of time left before, so hopefully we can garner some more interest in this project. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, the modular work is moving along the design for the modulars. The site contractor has mobilized um, and they have started putting up, they delivered the, some gravel to the site and the cold tech units and infiltration units. They have, they, today they were working on their temporary fencing with the um, scrim covering and then the erosion control and the Tomorrow they're going to work on the silk sacks. So, um, so the weather's been cooperative, which is really great, and they're moving right along. There has been a lot of interest by the neighbors, so we are scheduling a um, information session, which we want to talk to the committee about. We can talk about it maybe a little bit in more detail, maybe at the end of the meeting about the logistics. But we are thinking um, March 27th at 6 p.m., which is next Monday night. Um, and I know we're eager to get on to the presentation, so I don't know if we want to talk, Jay, at the end about the timing. And yeah, I think so. When we go over the schedule, is that all right? <clears throat> Anyone else? Push it off. And just to clarify, it would be mobile. It would be a remote, it would remote be a meeting. Meeting. Yep. Like yep. And, yep. And, and Meg, you, you'd be available. Hill would be available. Tape would be available, and we can kind of go over some things. I, I I got a couple of text messages myself from screenshots on Facebook. So so it sounds like there's a lot of there's some rumors and misinformation out there. It would be yeah. good to kind of straighten it out a little bit and we can field questions from neighbors and maybe yeah, yeah. Help things move forward. And that is about it for the update. Okay, moving on to design review, and that will be uh Juana Lawson. Chai, you want to kick that off or? Um, sure. I think David, David, um, I, I ended up forwarding David an invite. Um, He's with here. My name on it. So if you see two Dave, so, so if you see two Charlies, yep. one of us is David. So with us this evening is uh, David Warner um, from Warner, obviously principal and owner of Warner Larson Landscape Architects, as well as Michelle Callahan is a senior project manager at Niche Engineering, and possibly Michelle's partner, uh, um, colleague, um, yep, Matthew, um, who is going to talk about bridge design a little bit. Um, and so our intent here is to take about half of the, our time to talk about landscape design and half of the time to talk about civil design. And I think what we'll try to do is let both David and Michelle uh, uh, get, let David get through his presentation, open the floor to questions and then at the appointed time, move to Michelle and Matthew and then let them do their presentation and then open the floor to questions on um, civil design. 
And the reason I say that is I think it's important you hear from 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 everybody, and I don't want a situation where we don't get <laughs> through our agenda. So it makes sense to me. So and I, we made made sense supposed to, to do landscape first because that's an opportunity to sort of set the table and talk about um, how the how the site is laid out. And of course, you've all seen the site multiple times, and it isn't dramatically different. But I think David and Michelle will be able to do a much better job of describing it than I can. So. With that, uh, handing it over to David. Oh, and David, your name is now David. Cool. Welcome. Somebody uh, corrected the spelling of your name, Charlie. <laughs> to something more suitable. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, I'm going to share my screen, and I'm working off my laptop, so you might see your faces temporarily pop up, but then I'll switch over. Uh, there we go. Good. Um, so this is the overall site plan, as Charlie said. You're Quite from oh, okay. <clears throat> All right, so everybody can see that. Good. Um, so I am going to. This is we're at the obviously the design development phase, nearing the end of the design development phase of this project, and I'm going to be walking you through the detailed um, site program function areas. We've met with the district and gotten their input with regard to how those spaces are used and how the site um, you know needs to function from a drop-off, circulation, traffic, parking, all of that, outdoor play spaces. And uh, and, and so um, that that's as, as an overview. This plan is um, hot off the press with the uh, latest updates, on, um, but nothing major has changed. I'm going to just um, orient you uh, first where Horn Pond Brook Road is off to the right and Pond Street and Brantwood Road off to the left and the west, north is straight up. And <clears throat> the, um, the Overall, um, uh, the, the design as far as where you're coming in and circulation hasn't really changed. There's been a few updates along the way uh, with regard to um, the, the driveway and parking. I'll, I guess I'll start over in this corner because coming in from Horn Pond Brook Road, and I'll be able to zoom in on this a little bit as we go through um, so you see it in a little bit more detail. <clears throat> the existing building, uh, as you can see, is outlined in red just to help orient you uh, where we are. And then the um, survey is in the background, along with the aerial photographs to help um, orient you as well. But the um, existing paved area and parking over here uh, is being removed and we're replanting that area um, in, in, in preparation for filing the notice of intent with the Conservation Commission. Uh, and Michelle will be talking, I'm sure, a little bit more about um, that process. But as you come in, this is a two-way drive. We did change this parking area from 90-degree parking um, to the angle parking to support um, a one-way circulation, but primarily to reduce the impervious surface um, within the, the buffer zones as you see them here. Uh, it adds a little bit more green space. It helps to reinforce the, the traffic flow. Uh, and then to offset that, since we uh, have really had no net change on the parking program, is we did expand uh, parking over here into the slope. The, this, uh, these head-in parking spaces over here are being excavated out into the slope a little bit uh, to offset that. So <clears throat> this is the primary drop-off loop on the east side. Um, and for emergency vehicles, uh, we are uh, allowing for this heavy-duty reinforced concrete paving as this pedestrian way, pedestrian spine, actually, that carries all the way across um, to uh, allow uh, emergency vehicles to get into the front of the building and serve as a fire lane. We do have a, um, a barrier at this point. It's actually not rendered in this plan, but we uh, were talking with the uh, facilities folks about how those could be designed. We're still working that detail out, probably collapsible bollards at that location uh, so that it would prevent unauthorized vehicles from coming in. Um, but then uh, this this area here is designed for passenger vehicles as well as um, small trucks, but not large emergency, or emergency vehicles or large trucks. Um, the center of the site plan, uh, as originally envisioned, does provide a, a very nice large play area. This is a structured play zone uh, for various types of play equipment and a play lawn that right now is in the project as uh, synthetic turf. Um, that would have an organic infill and a, and a uh, shock pad underneath of it for safety. The uh, parking area behind it is slightly higher, so we have a, a low crescent-shaped wall there to provide that separation. 
Uh, and we do have uh, fencing on the ends here for ball containment on either end of that. But this is, um, we were inspired by the play space in front of your existing school, you know, directly out in front of the administration. Um, really a great place to be able to see when parents are dropping off their kids and when during the day when kids are going out for play at recess um, to be a very visible, very safe area on the south side of the building. And then on the west side, um, we have a drop-off zone where traffic coming from Brantwood Road would drive down Brantwood Road and enter the site at your current um, where your current service area is behind your existing building. Um, and that would be oriented then uh, to drop, to come around this loop uh, this way uh, with, with um, parking adjacent to it. Um, as far as the um, drop-off sequence is concerned, uh, we know that down in the pre-K area, uh, the timing of that program is such that, um, you know, parents coming and going can come in and park and go inside you know, or a, uh, I guess there's also a rolling drop off for some of the some of the students. Parents can drop can drive through this loop here. Um, one of the significant elements that we've been talking about was how to control the access through this point right here, um, because of course there are concerns about whether how how open the traffic should be from the very beginning before we even came on board on this project. Um, there were concerns about, you know, traffic between Horn Pond Brook Road and Pond Street. So nevertheless, for, uh, for maintenance, for access, for emergency access, and also potentially for the administration to um, allow for certain drop-off activities and pickup activities to pass through this opening um, for how, how the site wants to be flexible and adapt to um, needs over time. There was a specific request at the last meeting that we had a couple of weeks ago with the district that this be a um, automated gate and it would be an electric barrier arm style gate um, with a pedestal on one side uh, could have would have like um, a fob access on either side so um, drivers could drive up and uh, and wave that have authorized access through there probably more like your maintenance and emergency personnel uh, maybe staff but that at other times of the day, for instance, if uh, afternoon queuing was such that um, they wanted uh, you know, cars to be able to go through this point here and maybe exit out to Pond Street, that, that gate could be left open and it can be controlled remotely uh, within the administration's office. So um, it's basically allowing maximum flexibility where somebody does, doesn't have to run out there multiple times during the day to open and close a manual gate. And we thought that that was a a good suggestion. Um, so we are incorporating that in the drawings at this time. Um, as we look across the front of the building, these program spaces still remain um, the same as what you've seen previously. So directly adjacent to the pre-K classrooms, uh, we have an outdoor pre-K play space. And um, one of the updates that we haven't been able to make to this yet was um, the suggestion that we put some a little more uh, shade trees in here uh, one on this side and maybe a little bit uh, on this side, but have some space between, we have put these plants between the windows uh, in the classrooms and the outdoor space because people were concerned about the proximity to the classrooms and the distraction of uh, the use of that space directly outside. This is an outdoor classroom here, halfway between the two main entrances to the building. And this is um, a space that has um, an area for group instruction and also some work tables um, and we'll have um, there is photovoltaic panels that are planned over top of this that will provide some shade um, and some shelter. Uh, while I'm on that topic, photovoltaics, as I'm sure you are aware, um, are planned for going over this bay of parking and over the three bays of parking in this lot over here as well. And the planning for those um, subsurface improvements such as foundations and conduits um, are in the coordination phase at this point. Um, so then as we move around to this end, this is outside of the cafeteria. And uh, we, uh, the, the district was pleased with this idea of teachers being able to go outside uh, to a small dining space. And um, there was a suggestion that we could make that, uh, provide an accessible route to that, which would be connecting out to this walkway here. Um, and then, um, the, all of the services occur down at this end of the building. This is um, where you know staff will be able to come in and park over here. 
um, emergency, sorry, um, service vehicles coming into the loading areas, which we know your trash and recycling uh, activities are stored in totes inside the building and brought out for pickup, um, would be accessed by trucks pulling into this space, backing up, and then pulling back out. Uh, so we do have this, this large kind of um, trapezoidal space in here is for that maneuvering where they pull into this, this driveway aisle and, and are able to back up and, and turn out. On this corner is where you have your generator and then um, your uh, trash um, larger dumpster and um, transformer. We have a gate at this end and a gate at this end of the driveway that goes around, around along the back. So this is doubling as hard surface play outside the gym where we have a half basketball court and some painted games. Uh, it also is fully accessible. I should say that this, the site is fully accessible, um, but coming around back is um, accessible from uh, circumnavigating the building, but also coming from the building out to this area. Um, we are improving and widening the um, paved way going down to the field because that is now what um, is going to be the maintenance access for the fields currently that behind um, the parking area in this zone of the ex existing site, you, you may be aware there's a trail uh, that kind of comes off the parking area here and goes through the woods to the former water department parcel <clears throat> to get out to the fields. And um, this uh, driveway fire lane is, is actually on a fairly um, deep fill area. So that there, there will be, I'm sure, some pathways maybe that, that find their way around there for people wanting to follow a desire line. But this paved route uh, getting to the back and for maintenance vehicles being able to come to this parking area and then bring their equipment down to the field, that would be the, the new route for that. Um, the, um, or, or, I think it was at the end of schematic design that the uh, district was asking for another play area um, back here down at the fields, associated with the fields, and that it could be beneficial both in terms of um, parents being able to supervise the young children while their older kids are playing sports, playing on the fields, but also benefits the school as a, another play space uh, out the back of the building. So as you see in the floor plan here, you can come all the way through the building, through these main lobby spaces and come directly out. Um, we have these access points that come all the way out to that paved route. We do have this um, kind of informal pathway, this direct route coming down to that play space, but we also have a set of steps and this accessible route ties back so that we have full accessibility to that lower play area as well, which happens to be cut into the embankment there. Um, so on the north side of the building, we pulled these two outdoor classroom spaces a little bit further away from the building so they get some nice uh, light exposure and uh, aren't in total shade. But of course, you know, when you're um, looking for comfort in um, on a sub hot September day or maybe a, a, a May, a day in May, we nice to get a little bit of shade actually. So um, those are spaces that are also, you know, close to the academics uh, side of the building where teachers can take students outside and having three um, distinct outdoor classroom spaces, the one in the front and the two in the back provides a lot of opportunity for a school of this size for teachers not to have to compete too much for the use of those outdoor spaces, which are really highly sought after. Um, and then this, this plaza space in the middle is really more of a, a flexible gathering space could be used for in many different ways. Um, but it's, um, it's highly visible from inside the building as you look out and it's very inviting, I think as a, as a place to congregate, you could take an entire class out there at a time, um, but could also serve as maybe your fourth outdoor classroom. So lastly, as I hand it off to Niche, I wanted to zoom in just briefly over um, here where we have, um, and there'll be, uh, Niche will be talking in a lot more detail about um, this bridge, but we have been coordinating with them uh, with regard to the, um, how the, the bridge, their bridge design is tying back into the landscape relative to uh, grades and uh, what you can see here, this is a walkway that is sloping at under one in 20, one inch, uh, one foot and 20 feet. So that doesn't need any handrails. It's fully accessible, um, barrier free. And it gets um, to this side where there's a ramp segment that brings you down to the sidewalk elevation. We didn't have survey in this area, so we're using the aerial photograph to demonstrate, but there's a sidewalk running along Hornpond Brook Road 
that will pull you back to um, this curb ramp and tie into the rest of the accessibility. And so this will be uh, able to accommodate any students that are walking from the north and the east. Um, you know, I think still students coming up from the south uh, may, may want to come in this way here. We do have a crosswalk at this point. Um, it's certainly preferred, I think, um, if people are coming up from the south to cross uh, Royal and then Horn Pond Brook and come across this crossing because um, the traffic on Horn Pond Brook Road, I think particularly at, at morning drop-off time, is uh, anticipated to be maybe a little bit, and the sight lines, I think, and coming across here. It's, this is a safe crossing point, but it's, it's more desirable to cross here. So that might be something that uh, the administration would want to uh, educate parents about, you know, before the school reopens after construction. So I'd like to open it up to questions. Chris, first up. Um, so David, um, great job. I um, appreciate the presentation. Um, for committee members who, who don't know, David was also the landscape architect on the VO project with TAPE. Um, I just had two, two, two questions. They're both kind of detailed. Um, you talked about the artificial turf in front of the building and the and your idea that it would be like an organic infill. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Would it be, I think the only one I'm aware of is cork. I mean, I think I've heard of like coated sand. Um, what are you thinking there? And that because this is an elementary school and it's not like a regulation, for instance, football field, um, are there kind of shock or impact standards that you're designing towards that are perhaps somehow less stringent and so there's less excavation, less cost. Um, maybe help me understand that a little bit better. Sure. Um, there are really good examples of this field um, in the local vicinity and we've been now working with this product which is made out of a um, U.S. grown pine based um, fiber. It's um, manufactured in Georgia and uh, it's totally organic which is great and locally well sourced within the United States. And yep. a lot of the other organic materials are imported, uh, coconut and cork, for instance, um, that from countries that don't have the same um, uh, criteria for pesticide use that we do. Um, so I think uh, that's one good thing. And so um, the East Somerville Community School is a very similar application. It's a very, it's a small youth soccer field like this, although this is not really intended to be a soccer field. We showed a little U6 field on here, uh, for example. It's really just a free play area that can take tons and tons of use without uh, showing the wear and tear that natural grass does. Of course, we love to use, use natural grass whenever we can, uh, and your fields out back are a perfect example of, of a good application for that. But uh, here, we you're going to have year-round use, uh, intense use, uh, and the grass has no chance to recover. Our alternative to this would be pavement. And so this is a permeable material um, and the organic material is, is pine based. The sand is used as a ballast, but not the acrylic coated sand, uh, just uh, natural uh, rounded silica sand. Mm -hmm. And uh, the shock pad is something that we put in there. Uh, for this age group, um, the impact, yeah, we're not using like FIFA standards for uh, the fall height of an adult, but um, frankly you know the difference between in millimeters for um the thickness of a pad for that versus uh, something a little bit thinner like um it it's three millimeters between a 14 millimeter pad and a 17 millimeter pad um and the cost difference is negligible so um we can design to a 14 millimeter pad and that's perfectly safe and acceptable um the, the um, standards that are used to measure that is the head injury criteria Mm -hmm. uh, which is the same uh, method that's used for playgrounds, but you don't have a fall height here. So the application would be, uh, it, the only application for that, the testing method is based upon an adult uh, athlete launching themselves into the air and falling on their head, um, which is a 1.3 meter fall height. So that's, that's what we're using for the safety standards and it's widely used. I'd be happy to send you more examples, but like Capuano Field and East Somerville Community Field in in Somerville are both uh, examples of this exact type of field that we're talking about. That's great. I didn't know the I didn't know the pine option even existed, and I assume therefore, like in the summer when it's really hot, 
that that field is not radiating as much as if you have like the crumb rubber that a lot of communities have, right? Where it's, it's absorbing all that heat energy. Um, so I, that's terrific. Um, Jay, my other question for David, uh, David, if you can sort of pan uh, to the right uh, up at that bridge over Horn Pond Brook, um, is the curve, so I, I just wanna make a comment that I, I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm speaking out of step here, that the only real criteria for the committee and really for, for the select board is that this bridge be on the north side of the existing uh, vehicular bridge. Um, for the reasons you just said. So you separate the pedestrian and the vehicular traffic. And that I'm not aware there's any real magic. I mean, that, that needed to move more north. It could, depending upon, you know, what the topography would suggest. Is the curve that, is, is the curve that you're showing, is that curve there because you literally need the run given the rise that you have? And so that's why it's not a straight shot. Um, or is it also just part of that pedestrian experience? Because if it went straight, you're sort of directing kids towards this, you know, three-story kind of masonry wall. Um, yeah. It was more of a design gesture to orient uh, children coming and going from school towards where they would mostly be coming from. Yeah. Um, I know it favors um, the school arrival and dismissal as opposed to access to the fields, if that's what you're alluding to. Um, we're trying to also minimize the amount of pavement within the impervious area within the buffer zone. So that was a, another consideration not to have another branch, for instance. Coming right. straight, straight off, I think, is um, very likely going to have a desire line go that way anyway, because that's going to be the predominant traffic. Yeah. Okay. No, that makes sense. And the old, the old, my, my third, it's a comment more than a question, but I believe on the VO project, given some of the challenges we had on other school projects in town, we had some ADA violations where we had ramps that should have been one in 12 and they weren't, they were just out of spec, just barely. Um, so given the imperfect nature of materials, whether it's settlement of pavers or the slump of concrete, we had asked you to not to design right to the MAAB limit, right? But, but to be a little more conservative to whether it's a, contractor error or again just the variability of materials so I, I would encourage you to be doing the same thing here um even though that the construction drop documents can be exactly right um, we have a history in this town where folks show up with a smart level mm -hmm. and we're just out of spec and then we have to tear something up at uh, significant expense uh, but but just for the record we did not have to do that on vo so not throwing shade at you <laughs> but uh for some pretty recent work um we've had to do that Thank you for pointing that out. And just to reassure you and members of the EFPBC, we do build in tolerance to all of our uh, accessible routes because the slopes in the Architectural Access Board and the ADA are maximums and you can't build perfection. We understand contractors can't build perfection. So we use um, 4.8 as a maximum percentage um, on concrete and actually round that down a little bit for asphalt because it's a little more regular. And for ramps, uh, we use uh, we use seven point eight, even though you can go to eight point three three. Right, Colleen, Thank and you. then Mark. Great, um, David. Beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm also the chair of the sustainability committee. So I have a couple of questions related to that, um, but I'm also a parent that's been going to the site every day for 10 years. And I have another like four or five years ahead of me. <laughs> so I'm thrilled about all the improvements. So I'm gonna take through these pretty quickly. Um, one of the issues that we have in the morning, which I'm sure you've been made aware of is, is um, how fast oh. folks go through the site, um, especially after drop off, it sort of is like an abandonment of, you know, some parents are like, all right, my kid's out. Now I'm gonna drive 80 miles an hour outside. Um, so I wonder if there are, so in addition to some of the, the I, I see some of the crossings that you've dedicated, I just wonder if there's anything else in terms of like raising pavement and things like that. Um, where I look at the connection from, and we're thrilled that the, you know, the plan is flipped so that we actually have access to the beautiful woods that is, you know, where the current Lynch is right now. So the idea of making that connection back to that, that um, greenway, I think is, is fantastic and wonderful. And however we can make that the safest, whether that be through looking at, um, 
again, raise pavement or change in pavement, things like that, because folks, as you probably know, the, the kids will make their way from any of the green areas across mm -hmm. the street there. So even though there's not a crosswalk, the kids will be moving there. So I just ask you to think about that and, uh, you know, as one of one of the many things that you're considering to think about how we can make those areas a bit safer. Um, the other thing which we can talk about with niche it is is the flooding issues. So often our parking or playground area becomes a lake with floating, um, um, you know, wood chips. So I, I, you know, I obviously we're going to be handling stormwater in a better way. Just wanted to kind of reinforce. It seems like that's you know pretty much maybe just north of the location of the current where the current. Um, playground area is, and I'm sure that we're lifting a little bit, but that that becomes a condition. I'm thrilled also about the synthetic turf using a natural condition so that there's not issues of heat. We're looking at like a puffed rice for Arlington High School, but the pine sounds even better. Um, let's see. In the future, in the near future, we'd like to have a session, you know, maybe in the next month or two on solar and where we're locating some of the canopy pieces and how that where that lands in your landscape plan. So that's something that will be hopefully coming up soon. I and then this diagram, I don't know, Charlie, if you wanted to even mention this, but I had it in queued up if you wanted to. Right. No, that's, yeah. that's fine to talk about it because that's sort of the 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 as of now the approved or the, the yep. preferred approach. So we're kind of waiting I think uh, until we have more data on on exactly what we're going to need in terms of production, but but that is the general intent, and we have Colleen um, talked to both Niche and and Warren Larson awesome. about these locations. Great, yeah. Once we get the energy model back, I think that's the right sequence. We're going to circle back and have you know figure out if we have enough solar and if we have to add some, where that will go. And then the last thing, I'm trying to move fast is that the idea of trying to pull some of the greenery inside the building you know, we've got you know I, I, obviously your scope is probably entirely exterior but there's this beautiful wall inside one of the entryways and that just i just wanted like a sort of food for thought of how because this is this is so beautiful and fantastic i love all of the layers of vegetation i love how this is going to deal with urban heat island especially like changing the thermal comfort conditions in the playground and all of that's going to be great. So the last piece is like, how do we bring that materiality like formally or, you know, any, any thoughts on um, the idea of, you know, biophilia and, and how we make that connection. So a large, large part of biophilia is the visibility from within the building to the nature space outside. Um, just in terms of the wellness benefits of being able to have that visual connection to nature. I, I defer to Charlie for any installation within the building. Um, we did talk about and showed renderings of a green wall, and we also showed a planter by the ramp going down to the gym. So we were trying to think about places we could do that. Um, that would, and we just did a really nice green wall. And we're talking about plants on that open, um, of some kind of plants on that open um, second floor outdoor classroom space, so awesome. we can continue to explore those things. But they were in the um, they were in the renderings, so the, those uh, those early ideas, and we do have it in the estimate. Awesome, great. Uh, just to respond, oh, I'm sorry. If you wanted me to respond to the trails, I'm sorry they didn't okay. show up in the rendering here. We are planning for those connections, and uh, I just apologize that we didn't show it. Um, I, I believe we're looking at the crossing over here, um, mm -hmm. so that that relates, you know, to uh, the the least amount of traffic interference to get onto the trail system. That's great. Hey, Mike. Uh, great, David. Uh, excellent presentation. Really love the variety of outdoor spaces, along with accommodating all of the, the parking and solar needs for, for the school. My only comment has to do with the, the drop-off zone. And I don't think it's necessarily a problem, but just something that may require a little bit of education for the staff, particularly during drop-off, because you have the primary drop-off on a loop at the east side of the site, the, the desire is often to just stop closest to the door 
mm -hmm. and get out when really it may actually need to be a queuing situation where people are going much farther around the circle to, to queue up. And again, it may just be a kind of a staff education thing to, to talk through and maybe you've already done the queuing studies as well for how people get in and then how they bypass the, the line if there is a way to do that. Yeah, um, I can speak to that briefly. I, I know um, afternoon is when you have the biggest issue with queues. So uh, in the morning, you know, it's more of a uh, rolling uh, drop off type of situation, touch and go. But in the afternoon, the um, district says that they basically are allowing, you know, vehicles to queue up and then they take, I think, four or five cars at a time um, to load them, particularly, I think that's for the pre K. Um, where teachers will be um, bringing the children to their parents' vehicles in an orderly way. And then that batch of four or five cars leaves, and then the next batch comes in. Uh, and specific to that um, understanding, uh, we were then looking at um, actually striping out this area as a do not block the box <laughs> so that as people are driving in, uh, they don't obstruct people who would might use it, be using this parking lot from exiting. Uh, but this would just be, you know, like some diagonal or cross-hatched um, paving with some signage, appealing to people not to stand with a vehicle blocking that that intersection. Uh, so we are aware of it. Uh, we've accommodated literally the maximum amount of curb and sidewalk interfaces we possibly can on this site, yeah. without uh, taking away from the heart of the design, which I think is so important. Awesome. Thanks, Ethan. Uh, hi, David. I, I'm from a little bit of um, Vincent on. I have seen you too. So I have a, just a question, you know, with the grading, the plan that we have here, just in a gross sense, where would it be cut and where do it be filled? Just, uh, uh, you know, at the end, is it a balance or just curious? I think know, we, <laughs> we, of course, are, are really working hard uh, to make a balance. And yeah. there are many layers, as you know, uh, that go yeah. to uh -huh. the finished construction, uh, the final uh -huh. surface, the base courses associated with that, and then um, the, the subgrades. But <clears throat> the cuts in general are towards the south end of the site. Um, and, you know, there's a little bit of um, landform over on, um, I think as, you, as you're coming around this way, that starts to flatten out. By the time you're all familiar, down here, it's all relatively flat. Um, but then where the building is going is pushed back over the existing play area and into that pine knoll. So yeah. there's a, a pine knoll here. And mm -hmm. um, there is, you can see the topographic, the existing contours underneath. So mm -hmm. there's a bit of this uh, knoll that is excavated, but there's also yeah. a hollow space in, in here that's going to be filled with structural mm -hmm. fill, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and the fill extends out uh, on the east end of the building as well. I think I mentioned that earlier about the fire lane. Um, but um, I think we're, and Charlie may be able to comment on this as well, but I think we're pretty close to a, a cut and fill balance. Of course, that's something that we look at multiple times through the yeah. design process when we do the estimating. And there's two different estimators that get reconciled. We don't have the, um, this being, you know, low bid, we don't have a CM who also provides a third level of analysis on that. Yeah. Um, Charlie, in, do, do you recall specifically if we're close to a balance on this? I know that's that was our objective all along. Yeah, we didn't, I don't, I, um, sorry, um, I'm having trouble with my video. Um, I have not looked at the current estimate in detail relative to that, but we have not dramatically changed the location of the building or the grading plans and schematic design. So I suspect that the scope is very similar to the way, what it was then. Um, all right. Um, my follow-up question, David, um, you know, the access road at the back of the building, mm -hmm. um, at the end of the day, um, where would it drain? You know, how are you catching it? Would it anything gets into the field or is it, you know, how is it pitched or there's a retaining wall behind it or just curious. Um, so that's probably a good segue for Niche's presentation, but we do have a okay. curbed edge along there um, uh -huh. and it is being captured. Uh, it is vehicular, so it needs to be treated. And uh, that's probably about the extent of what, we, we don't need a retaining wall for it. We do need a retaining wall for the playground down below. 
Um, you can see uh, the existing contours in this area, for instance, how we're, you can see why we need a fill down here, uh, but then we're close to grade up in this vicinity, and then there's fill over in here. So um, I would like um, Michelle from Niche Engineering to be able to speak a little bit more about like exactly where the water is going, how it's being captured and treated after we're through the landscape presentation. And designing the uh, porous um, payment, is it um, overlapping between Niche and Arasa? Um, I'm just curious, who is designing the porous uh, paved areas? Like uh, who performed the percolation test and, you know, just curious. Niche Engineering can speak to that. Okay. Chris, you have another question? I do. I, I have a follow-up. I, I was dwelling on the, the observation Mark Scott made about um, the traffic queuing there in the morning um, and in the afternoon. And it's, I was just looking back at an earlier version of the site plan. So it, it looks like, David, that parking lot there on the right, that's gotten a bit smaller in terms of capacity Correct. seat schematics. And I guess we've offset that by expanding the lot just south of the artificial turf. Um, I'm just gonna ask a really dumb question because um, I don't think we've explored this in some of the earlier iterations. Was it ever considered to create, I'm, I'm gonna make an analogy here. Um, the, 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 the loop that you have on the left side, on the west side of the site has a parking lot that's sort of nestled in the middle, right? On either side of the drive lane. Was there ever any consideration to do something similar on the right? But what I mean is that if you were to take that drive lane, you're coming in, you're dropping off, you're, let's say you're coming for pickup in the afternoon in your car, you pass the parking lot um, and you turn into this road for this queuing area. Yep, you're and keep going, keep going, David, and then you're gonna make that right turn. Okay, yeah. If that roadway was actually pulled to the east to create a much longer queuing loop. And then we nestle that parking lot in the middle, kind of like what you've done over there on plan left. That would seem to, prov it, would, it would provide just a far greater, you know, linear footage for cars to queue. Uh, I'm just thinking the way it works at Morocco, for instance, which is a smaller school, and the cars just queue up all along the sidewalk and all the way up Bates Road now when we put in a um, a sidewalk. It completely transformed uh, pickup at Morocco School. I mean, it, it cut it by more than half. Um, the idea being the kids come out of school and they just start walking along the sidewalk and down Bates Road until they find the car. Um, you know, Brian... Brian was around to, to see it before and after and probably has similar observations. So it, it just seems to me this is, we, we can only cue so many cars in what is kind of a horseshoe, you know, pattern. But if you pulled that to the east, you would create a much longer queue zone, put the parking lot in the middle, and then you also address the very question Mark raised, which was, you know, blocking the box. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if most of the traffic is coming in for queuing up, you just you turn to the right and you've got a much longer distance to queue up. Does that make sense what I'm asking? So the uh, queuing distance as far as the sidewalk interface with the, the drop off pickup zone, I agree. The actual linear footage of this versus that I would think would be roughly equal. But what you're talking about is uh, a zone that has a like over here has a sidewalk interfacing with it along the entire length so that yes. you could have a longer car uh, queue where people can walk to the vehicle. Yes. And you, and you effectively could be picking up kids all along the front sort of parallel to that pre-K face of the school building. Right. Whereas right now it just, it, it turns 180 degrees. You, you could have a curb there. Kids could go out and get into a car. Um, yep. Well, um, other considerations to, to think about relative to that, um, besides <laughs> what <laughs> Niche and, and uh, Tape are thinking right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, I can't, obviously, I have to consult with my team to figure out what we're capable of doing at this point, but um, it, it seems plausible, I'll just say that, um, since we have now reduced the number of parking spaces over here, it wouldn't have been plausible in my opinion, to achieve the same net no, uh, no loss in parking. If we were trying to recreate the 
quantity of parking that we used to have over here. Um, right. So it's sort of like a iterative process where we've reduced the parking over here and now we've created this scenario where that actually is plausible. Um, but the other considerations are, we're looking at this as a uh, major uh, stormwater uh, absorption zone yep. for the impervious surfaces uh, in the middle part of the site here. Um, and uh, I think that type of water quality, natural low impact development water quality treatment is a really important part of what we do uh, particularly on th this half of the site as it uh, as the water is draining towards the brook. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I can't answer definitively. Uh, I, I'm happy, Charlie, to to study that and to see where that takes us. But whether that gets traction and causes a change in the site plan direction, that's uh, beyond just my my voice. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, and, and I appreciate that. And as challenging as pickup is today, this school is going to be so much larger. So. The but, I mean, this has a sidewalk along the loop, right? Down to here. It does. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, you can have a significant, and over here, you can have a significant queue. And the, the way the pre-K works, they told us they work, is it's a rolling drop-off. So, uh, it's a live drop-off. So, theoretically, people are moving relatively briskly through here. And the pre-K is a smaller operation and they dismiss early anyway. They want to get those kids and parents. Right. So we're imagining this as the pre-K drop-off. You can't see what you're pointing at, Charlie. Okay, the loop. Your <laughs> your hand they can show you. Yeah. Charlie, I think you had mentioned in a much, much earlier presentation as well that there was some appeal to having a, a relatively circuitous entry sequence from Hornbrook Road to significantly slow traffic speeds yeah well that should as, help as well yeah and that if you had a sharper turn to a drop-off loop that that might not be as appealing because it feels more direct and therefore higher speed right and that was one of the re requirement one of the requests of the town engineer was to, to make it more circuitous okay but i think you know it's a reasonable amount of drop-off there quite a few cars. I mean, we could measure the cars, but. Hmm. Well, what, what I would, I guess what I would hope to avoid is, and I don't know um, how many Ambrose parents we have on this call tonight, but I, 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 there is a traffic pattern that's supposed to be followed at Ambrose. There are kids who just get out of the car and run across the parking lot. You know, they don't, they don't necessarily do what they're supposed to do. And the same thing may be true at pickup. And I'm trying to imagine a scenario in which kids see a car and it's there in the far lower right hand corner. So they're, you know, they're, they're running across the parking lot, right. To get to a car. Um, but that maybe that's <laughs> just not reasonable. Um, all right, I'm done. I want to throw we have Mark and then Colleen. Just trying to Can stay I have schedule. just one quick comment, Jay, if you don't mind, I was just asking, I thought, um, I thought with the drop-off pattern, with the improvements that we are doing outside, that would sort of work together so that we would, uh, at least in the morning, that we would minimize the vehicles coming in, then that would go with the core along this age of, you know, um, green school. So I don't understand why we need to um, facilitate, facilitate to have more cars lined up especially in the mornings. I mean, I can understand the lunchtime pickup and whatnot we have this. So all I'm saying is I think we have to look together with the improvements that we are doing outside so that we can work a scheme that the vehicles just simply come in and drop off the kids just outside and, you know, um, and the kids just walk through the sidewalks or whatnot. So that's all I wanted to say. But I, I remember one time I asked about the compost, um, Plot, is there any further thought given? And I just forgot when I asked. Oh, for composting. You mean yeah. from the school kitchen? I, uh, Chris and Jay, one time I asked in the meeting, and, and you guys mentioned a uh, thought would be given. I was just wondering how far it was taken in one of those um, previous meetings. I remember asking. Wait, are you talking about the kitchen waste? I mean, for the, the, um, for the garden yeah. area. You know, um, uh, compost, you know, um, I think Charlie mentioned that they have done it. I, I don't, not necessarily kitchen, if the kitchen is going to have it, but if it could be even open to the community, they can come and, you know, dump as a compost. So we, but, we think initially there's, the, it won't be a full service kitchen necessarily, although it's designed to be one in the future. 
um, we did talk to the district um, at reasonable length about uh, outdoor garden um, opportunities. So there is outdoor gardening opportunities uh, envisioned here. And part of the outdoor gardening um, space, uh, it's it's very easy to accommodate a small uh, spot where the um, herbaceous waste from that can be composted. It's a it's great as an educational um, opportunity to make compost as part of the gardening process. It doesn't take up a lot of space. Okay, so all right, that, that's all I asked. It would be sort of designated that it would be known and it could be used or uh, something like that. Okay, Brian. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions. So where would the sort of short term parent visitor spaces be kid forgotten instrument, whatever pop in for five minutes? Where would those parking spaces be? Uh, so we haven't uh, yet designated what might be reserved uh, spaces <clears throat> other than uh, what we need to do for code accessibility and then um, you can see that we've labeled where we're planning on putting EV charging stations and the quantity of them. Um, as far as reserve spaces for like short term parking for visitors, they generally would be uh, close to um, the front, uh, you know, maybe in conjunction with any reserve spaces for school administration staff. Either uh, I think the goal over here with this lot is to keep it more flexible for parents who are coming in to park um, if they need to go inside for the little ones. But right. uh, is that right, Charlie, or no? Um, as over here, though, I think is, is what makes the most sense for visitors. And if there's a desire to have them on both sides um, and, and this gate is considered closed, um, then maybe the ones on the east side would be down at this lot here. It's I know it's a little bit of a walk, um, but when you um, start to allow that type of parking in here, it's it may be com in competition with the the twice a day pre-K drop off and pick up. Yeah, that, I was sort of looking at that area with the 21 angled spaces and thinking that whatever the intention we have for it is, people are going to use it for that purpose. In fact, frustrated people in the morning, the, the behavior for drop off is bad because parents are trying to go somewhere and they get frustrated and they go too fast and all sorts of things. But you can imagine people cutting through that loop too, just using that as an, another drop off area if they're stuck in a line behind the designated area. That's just, I don't know, it's just one sort of thought as we think about this, because th there is a lot of that, especially with obviously the pre-K, but then it's, it's an elementary school, so you just have a lot of that. Part I mean, for, five minutes for some reason or another, for some random reason on any given day. I think um, all everyone on this call knows it is absolutely impossible to foolproof one of these sites to get yeah. driver and pickup drop off behavior to, to, to act rationally. And so right. all we can do is do our best to create a situation that's simple to understand and hopefully is easy enough to monitor and police by the staff. And we did did walk through it with the district and they seem to be okay with it operationally in terms of the pickup drop off sequence. And we can put signage up that says visitor parking only, you know, it's just a question yeah. of where does the district want it. And I know that that Andrew and, and Frank and Chrissy were talking about what made the most sense for where to put you know, staff parking, in, but I don't think they had come to a complete conclusion and we're happy to um, sign it, put signage up however, you know, they wish. Well, one other just consideration, we've been considering um, solar canopies um, and I'm sure that the configuration of the parking has some bearing with the design and efficiency of whatever solar canopy plan we put together and given how sort of preliminary that plan is at the moment. Yeah. I think it's secondary to site safety and access and circulation, all of that. But I was wondering if there are any obvious, you know, configurations or implications on the landscaping plan that we'd want to think about if we were to advance a solar canopy plan. Uh, David, do you want to answer? I mean, I think the only we've we've gone through it. Most uh, anything in the center of the site would not be impact impact anything. I think on that left hand parking lot, 
the, the far western parking lot, we may lose a parking space or two. And uh, one of the points uh, that the facilities was looking for is to make sure that we were capturing the runoff from those roofs so that we didn't have uh, icing issues and drainage issues on the pavement. Um, so there's- Yeah, and we talked to Zapotec about that and their recommendation generally is to tie it into infrastructure so that it's a hard connection. Okay, gutters and downspouts. Gutters and downspouts, yeah. We all set, Brian? Okay, Colleen, you're up, but do you have still have a question? You're all set. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> we can keep moving. All right, if we, um, Charlie, you want to introduce Mitch? We'll move on. I can't. No introduction. Many people on the call know Michelle, and less, I guess, less people um, know Matthew. Um, but Michelle has been very actively working on this project for quite some time now, so um, uh, many people uh, already know her. So Michelle, take it away. Okay, thank you, Charlie. I'll share my screen. Okay. Can you all see it? Yes. Okay. Um, so as you can see, one of the most challenging parts of this site are all the resource areas that we have to um, deal with. So up here, you can see we have the 500 year floodplain, 100 year floodplain associated with the Herd Brook. Um, all development within the site um, work is with outside of the floodplain boundaries. So no work is happening within the floodplain. Um, there is a portion of the site that's happening within the 200 foot riverfront area. And uh, on the next slide, I'll kind of dive into some of the implications of that and some of the things we've been working through as we kind of make sure the project is in compliance with the Wetlands Protection Act and local bylaw. Um, I'll quickly walk through some of the utilities um, and then I'll get into the stormwater strategy um, and then I'll go into the riverfront area stuff and then I'll turn it over to Matt to talk about the pedestrian bridge. Um, so just quickly on the existing site, um, there is a sewer, drain, and water line that kind of cuts through the existing site that needs to be relocated as part of this project. It's underneath the proposed building footprint. Um, so as part of this project, we'll be relocating those utility services. Um, they cut through from Brantwood Road all the way out this way towards her, her Brook Pond Road. So um, we're going to be relocating those and then tying into them as necessary for the site work. Um, as well, as far as stormwater strategy goes, um, we are doing as much low impact development as possible. We're really trying to keep as much stormwater mitigation at the surface um, and really use the landscape to treat the stormwater as much as we can. Um, highlighted in yellow here, you'll see three bioretention basins um, that capture uh, stormwater runoff. So we'll start this one on the left here um, is taking runoff from the adjacent parking lot and driveway area. Um, providing pretreatment through this inlet pretreatment device and then filtering through uh, the bioretention section before overflowing and connecting into that closed drainage system here. Uh, this very large island system in here um, is also a bioretention area and that's also taking uh, runoff from this parking lot over here. We're able to get that runoff and pipe it over there as well as um, runoff from the adjacent turnaround loop here. Um, so, and I'll talk a little bit, I know the discussion just came up about kind of modifying this area and I can, when we get to the next slide, I can kind of talk about some of the restrictions and why this has been pretty thoughtfully um, planned out with the riverfront in mind as well as stormwater. Um, and this parking lot here, you can see along here, we have this other bioretention basin, which collects runoff from both the roof, some of the roof runoff we're able to get into here, as well as the adjacent uh, roadway area. So all of these bioretentions have overflow area drains. Um, if the water stage is up too high in the larger storms, it overflows and connects into the closed drainage system. Um, because of the large uh, building area, we weren't able to uh, use the bioretention basins to mitigate and treat all of the roof. Um, so we do have two additional underground subsurface um, infiltration systems that will uh, provide infiltration um, before <laughs> overflowing and connecting into that closed drainage system. We did try to size these as small as possible and really put our focus into maximizing the area that we could um, that we could use with the bioretention basins. Um, but we do have um, both the Mass DEP stormwater standbook uh, standards to meet, and then as well as the Town of Winchester stormwater regulations, which require us to meet both peak rate and volume. So that's really why we have the additional underground systems here. Um, I'll go to the next slide to talk a little bit about the riverfront. Um, 
So you can see here, we've done a lot of analysis looking at the existing riverfront area and the existing degraded area, um, and then looking at the proposed plan. And um, we've done multiple iterations of this, working together with Warner Larson to figure out how we can meet the Wetlands Protection Act regulations, specifically under the riverfront standards, um, having to do with redevelopment within a riverfront area. Um, and those regulations really talk about how much degraded area you're allowed to have. You can't really have an increase in degraded area. So you can see here um, the existing site, it goes pretty close to the Hurd Brook. Uh, within the 25 foot buffer here, you can see some of the parking is right up along that 25 foot. It's actually within it um, at this little corner here. Um, and so our proposed design was really looking at meeting those regulations, but really trying to improve the riverfront as much as possible um, and pulling the impervious area as far away from the brook as we could. So you can really see that here in this figure, we pulled out completely from the 25 foot no disturb and plan to um, rehabilitate within that buffer zone, uh, put some restorative plantings, clean it out of invasives as part of our mitigation efforts. Um, and the project within the riverfront area itself, we're actually reducing, I believe it's 2000 square feet of impervious area in the entire 200 riverfront area um, as well. So you can see here, so we've done a lot of push and pull with this existing, this proposed parking lot right here. Um, it's part of the reason why it got smaller and we shifted more parking outside of the riverfront because uh, we were really limited and it was pretty close with some of these calcs to try to limit the amount of degraded area uh, within the riverfront area. Um, I guess I'll ask for questions now before we get into the pedestrian bridge because then Matt's going to talk about something completely separate. I think that might make the most sense. Okay, hey, Mark, and then Colleen. Just a quick question. I can't. I can't read the values on your on your okay. comparison because too too small for my old eyes. But <laughs> uh, can you just give us high level? How, how do you do? Yeah. So we um, within the twenty five foot. You can see we pulled out. Um, let's see about two hundred square feet of impervious area within the um, twenty five foot. Um, we removed about seven thousand square feet within the one hundred foot. So really pulling out, like we only had a 2000 decrease in the whole 200 foot riverfront, but we've made a big improvement in pulling it back. So within that hundred foot riverfront, we lost 7,000 square feet of impervious area. Um, and so then some of that got made up within the 200 foot, um, but the way that the regulations are written, it's they really wanna improve that in-air riparian zone closest to the brook. So we really made an effort at focusing on pulling as much as we could out of that inner 100 um, and then doing what we needed to do within the 200. Excellent, thanks. Yep. Pauline? Great. Two quick questions. Um, as it relates to lead, have you run the, the percentile calculations and how are you? So, yeah, so with lead, it's a little tricky. So as you know, <laughs> uh, the trickiest part for this site will be what the lead boundary ends up being um, because the way that the stormwater credit is written, you have to capture that full you know, percentile storm within your site. And if we have some areas of the site within the lead boundary that are just running off, um, that, you know, and we can't capture due to topography or just doesn't make sense with our you know, close drainage system. That's what usually kind of trips up some of the projects like this. Um, if within the lead boundary, we can capture all the water, if the way that that boundary ends up working itself out, we are um, completely infiltrating the one inch over the impervious. So I, I think that we can meet those uh, requirements. It's just really going to end up with the lead boundary and how that shakes out and what we're able to capture versus not capture. Got it. And they've been a little bit more flexible in the low impact development requirements. So yeah. I know we've worked with you guys before to write great yeah. narratives about all the different <laughs> yes. areas. Um, yeah, I think our bio, I think because we have three bio basins, I think we have a good sell here. So I think like that side I'm, I'm comfortable with. It's really just the, can we capture all the water we need to capture? Awesome. And it, and it sounds to me, your strategy is just the best one where you're putting all of the focus on the green infrastructure above grade. So that that plant material that we just that beautiful landscape plan that we just saw doesn't get veed because yes. it's tied into the stormwater infrastructure. So I, I say that out loud for folks because that that is something that happens all the time on projects where the landscape gets veed, veed out. And if we did that, then we'd have to have below grade infrastructure. So yes. that's the only place that we often see that there's like a capital cost exchange where we can keep the plants and they do the good work. Um, so from your calculations, are you going to like that level of detail of what a tree drawdown is versus shrubs versus dense plant material, or is it pervious and pervious? Yeah, so we've done our hydrocad modeling um, just to show the pre-post versus, you know, we've sized the bioretention system so we know exactly how high the water is going to get. We don't get into the, the micro detailing of 
you know, what's this tree uptake? What's this vegetation uptake? It's really just cover surface type and then how that factors into our stormwater model. So your your team for UMass Amherst did a, an analysis because we're trying to make the case for that as well. And they and so they did actually do that level of detail of the tree drawdown versus the shrub and all of that. Yep. I, I would just keep that in our back pocket in case yep. the V exercise comes back, because I think that that, again, I just, we want to keep the plants. <laughs> yes, no, agree. <laughs> we want to keep the beautiful plants. Totally plant. agree. Yes. Yeah, it, it, I, I think the approach here is, is just spot on. So thanks so much. Thank so Colleen, that's duly noted and we're and we would love to keep the plants. So we will keep the plants in the estimate. <laughs> and and if you all as a committee come back and say, well, geez, you know, it's still too expensive. What do we do? We'll say, well, we didn't take any plants out. Do you want to take plants out? So it'll be up to you. <laughs> well, we having a cost comparison of those two things, I think is helpful because we think that V sometimes is like we can lop that off and not replace it with something else. So yeah, we haven't even talked about irrigation, which is the thing I was going to bring up, but I don't know if that's the conversation. So we'll put that in the in the side. So the, uh, David may be able to speak to this, but the district did ask for irrigation um, around the building. Yeah, right, I can't David? speak to any. Yes, we are in the process of looking into that, but I don't have a design for it. We need to confirm all of the landscape areas that need to be covered because there's lots of little compartmentalized uh, spaces. Uh, and then come back with, um, you know, an estimate for what the value of that is so that you can decide how far you want to go with it. Um, since we are talking landscape, though, sorry, Michelle. Um, one of the things I wanted to just mention, um, considerations relative to maintenance are really front and center with your facilities department. Um, and so these bioretention areas, we did talk with them about how to make them as maintainable as possible, because what are oftentimes sold these pretty pictures with tremendous amounts of biodiversity and a lot of uh, variation in plant type make it very difficult for people without the horticultural expertise to decipher a weed from a plant and to maintain them properly. So what we typically find is that these areas that you want to look neat in the center of the site most of the time, uh, or all the time, as much as possible, um, we, we uh, use mostly a herbaceous palette. And uh, there's a lot of variation and diversity you can get with that and the soils you'll get the benefits of the bio uh, retention with that um, but then at the end at periodically once or twice a season at the end of the season they can be cut down and left clean easy to get, get the trash out of there um, the, what Michelle was presenting along the with, we're eliminating that parking within the 25 foot and 50 foot uh, inner riparian zone that is where we can go all wild and natural. That's where we can go, you know, with the woody species and, and more biodiversity, because that's going to just kind of revert back to nature. But it is very important for the school uh, to have a very attractive, and I'm sure to you as well, have a very attractive uh, landscape. And it's just difficult to maintain when you put a lot of uh, woody species and diverse uh, species in the front of the school. So we are being very sensitive to that and um, making sure it's going to do its job from a water quality standpoint, but also keep maintenance in mind. Yeah, and I'm assuming, I, I know that we talked about this a while ago, but that a cistern was evaluated. I know when we get the rain is not when we need the rain always, unless we're doing a dual use for the cistern. But, you know, I look at the underground infiltration areas and I just, I'm just asking that question again, that was evaluated, right, for, for irrigation. Oh, re reuse? Yeah. Yeah, Charlie, that came up early, Charlie, and I forget, I can't remember why it got eliminated. Do you remember? Did we think we had any room? I can't remember. I think at first, because in the beginning, were we not going to do irrigation at all, David? That was the plan. Correct. And then I think this was a recent thing that came no, up. This so this is I guess, a recent request. Yeah, so I... I know we looked at it for the building. Maybe that's what we're, I'm thinking of, Charlie. That we so we talked about it with the MEP um, internal, but I'm not I'm not sure that we talked about it for external because I think the the plan was for no irrigation. So we can circle back and and talk about that with the design team. Sounds see great. What that looked like. Thanks again. Yep. Yeah. Ethan. Oh, hi, Michelle. I just have a question. <clears throat> How would you explain the existing um, 
um, drainage of the site. In other words, um, you know, um, if we go around the existing school building, are the existing storm drains or whatnot? So, um, kind of coming along the angle, um, you know, what is the drainage area contributing towards the school just because the way it's located and there are, are there any existing storm drains, you know? So, um, because uh, I guess that in the previous reports, whatnot that was filed with the MSBA, the best I understand was there was one line saying there wasn't a clear understanding to know how the existing site is draining. So, um, you know, just um, in, can you fill me in? And then I've been there on a rainy days and you walk along one side, you can see like, a, you know, runoff coming in different directions. So how, what is the drainage area considered in this design and whatnot? So take this through. Yeah, sure. So the existing site, um, it doesn't have a ton of closed drainage. There is that main drain line that cuts through the site, and there are several catch basins uh, throughout the site that connect into that closed drainage system and then go out. Um, this parking lot here, there is it just sheet flows directly into Herd Brook. So there's no treatment, there's no mitigation. Um, it's not being captured at all. It's just sheet flowing straight in. And that's kind of true for a lot of the site. There's a lot of sheet flow happening, not a lot of structures. Um, there's no treatment, there's no infiltration. Um, so really with this proposed design, we're really providing a full drainage design, you know, capturing, treating, infiltrating um, before overflowing and discharging. So it'll be a, a great improvement in the stormwater, both the, we're reducing both the peak rate and volume, but also in, um, improving the water quality tremendously. So I was driving the question towards how much offsite flow is contributing just because it's on a slope and flowing down. Uh, Do you yep, see yep, that? Yep. So uh -huh. you're talking about here. Yes. So we're analyzing, I can even pull up. Um, we have the drainage. So we've analyzed. So this is the kind of drainage map that we've kind of we're analyzing all these systems, right? So we're analyzing all of this water that's coming down off the hill and making sure that it's getting incorporated into some of these basins that we're describing here. So this is just a, a design uh, drainage area um, CAD file. Um, but you can see here we, we've taken into account all of this area coming down the hill um, so that okay. we can make sure that we are sizing our systems appropriately. Okay, so okay, so so how, why are you cutting down on this side? Just curious. Uh, on you know when you come to the um, west side, I don't know oh, the slope of the area very well. Like when oh, you, okay. um, no down south. Like okay, so is there a reason because there's a storm drain going along the Brantford Road? Is that why? Oh yes. Uh huh. Yeah, okay. so we have actually, we've broken it out. So we can see we have different design points located. Um, and I think we have four, yes, we have four for the site. Um, actually, so there's one that comes off this way towards Brantford Road. Then this way we have the closed drainage system that goes out towards Horn Pond Brook. Um, this is the Horn Pond Brook that just goes sheet flows in. And the existing site, there's actually a low point. There's a on site mm -hmm. that the water mm -hmm. kind of gets just trapped in. So we're incorporating that that's in our existing model that obviously goes away as part of this design. Um, and so we had to make sure that we were mitigating and matching the rate and volumes at each of these design points. Um, so anyway, you understood the core of the message, like yes. accounting for the outside flow coming yes. in and then I don't know, you know, is it coming into the site being treated and discharged? Or, but anyway, I just wanted yes. not to take this time off here, especially the same way when you get to the north, I also know the same way. I think I see um, you have accounted that too, like somehow in a fashion it's getting to the site, right? Uh, just yes. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, so we're taking, yeah, yep. We look at the topography, making sure we're taking into account everything that's getting to our site so that our systems would need to be sized appropriately. All right. And then I'm sure this is linked with, I know you mentioned um, the CONCOM has different regulations, EEP has different regulations. So this is all linked to the recent up and coming resilient codes or something like that to that effect. I mean, um, how do I phrase this? Sometimes I hear, okay, CONCOM want this, but this is what it is. I just wanted to sort of say in a neutral sense, this is all linked to the, you know, the recent and most, um, maybe, uh, um, you know, uh, the resilient uh, guidelines or whatnot. So it not be necessarily, this is what CONCOM want, the, at the end of the day, you know, the guidelines um, governs, correct? Okay. Correct, yes. So we have to meet the Mass DEP stormwater standards as mm -hmm. well as Winchester. Winchester has their own separate stormwater requirements. Mm -hmm. and yes, we have to meet both of those as part of this design. 
and okay. those are required under CONCOM as well. Right. So, um, so in that respect, I know there was in the past there was a study done by another consultant, I think for Charlie, and then the, those buffer zones were established, right? Are those buffer zones are also sort of a floating, or is a kind of fixed to the up and coming regulation? In other words, was the buffer zone was established by Weston and Saxon or something like that? Is that so, Charlie? So yeah, uh -huh. so the buffer zones, they were established, um, LEC performed um, flagging along Hornpond Brook, and then those flags were offset to create the 25 foot buffer, the 100 foot buffer, and then the 200 foot riverfront area. Um, so those are based off of the wetland flag locations themselves from the resource area. Um, so the wetland scientists flag those, and then we get those associated buffers from those flags. Okay. So that is that also linked to the um, um, is that buffer zone is linked by the wetlands measured in the field, or is it also linked to somehow to the um, uh, Hunt Plant Brook um, um, flood analysis? So however you want uh, to say. Got it. it. Okay. Yeah, so it's two so two separate things. So there's the uh -huh. floodway, there's a floodway associated with Pond, uh, Pond Brook, uh -huh. and then um, there's the riverfront area associated with it. So the flood studies that all has to do with these, you know, these hatched areas up here, and our work is staying outside of those. Um, so the the riverfront, they're based off of the wetland flagging. So the flood modeling, FEMA, that's these flood zones up here, and then uh -huh. the sep it's separate. The riverfront area has to do with the bank of the brook itself. Okay, so the next report summing, submitting to the MSBA would say all this in under your work and sort of, is that how you would present the, um, uh, you know, um, is it all in one place, it would all be talked about and how it was established and is that how it, you envision presenting? To the yeah, so when we get, to, when we file the notice of intent with CONCOM, we'll, we'll mention all of these resource areas and all of the, uh, the different ways that, you know, they were shown up, why they're shown on plan, where they're shown, um, and then our impacts in each of these areas. Okay, so one last question. Have you guys done percolation tests at the site or to what extent to nail down on these, um, by infiltration zone or just curious, you know, yes. is it practically possible to have pervious payment? And that's all I want to ask. This yeah. Question, so. yeah, yeah. So, um, yes, there were geotechnical explorations completed. Um, some of the, the results that we saw were favorable. There are some of um, in some areas here where we're showing our proposed bioretention. Um, those they're underneath the existing building. So obviously those test fit and perks can't take place until after that building comes down. Um, but the results that we did see outside of the building footprint and around here were favorable. Um, as far as previous pavement goes, um, we had shown that in the SD plans, I believe, and then it actually got removed because the town had concerns with maintaining it. Um, so we kind of switched our stormwater strategy and really focused on these bioretention areas instead. So in areas where we were showing forest pavement, now we kind of redirected those drainage areas to these bioretention basins. So that's why. So we're still getting infiltration. It's just going through another LID measure, not forest pavement. All right. So there isn't a single percolation test done to this date yet. Is that what there is? Yep. They're there just is. outside. Okay. Yeah, okay. outside of this area. Yeah. Okay. So you can see right. like this is the existing building. So yes, we've seen, we've had some scattered out throughout the site, and they they seem favorable. So we'll just have okay. to confirm once this building comes down. Yep. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Moving on. Okay, so I'll stop sharing and then I'll let Matt share his. Okay. Great, thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Thank you for um, letting us uh, kind of share this information with you. Uh, I am going to. No, I kind of take it anyway, but um, all right, I'll keep going. Um, so this uh, again, this is our um, our. Bridge elevation of the pedestrian bridge. Uh, I'm going to go back one sheet here just to give you um, an idea of the layout uh, before you look at the elevation. But um, so again, uh, this is the uh, Hornbrook Prime Road um, with the sidewalk coming along here, the existing uh, vehicle bridge uh, with the pedestrian bridge to the north of that, um, and obviously a path connecting that in and um, a ramp on um, this side of the path connecting um, the bridge to the, the existing sidewalk there. So 
Um, we position the bridge um, in this location uh, to be as close to the existing crosswalk across Thornbrook Pond Road as possible, um, but also because this was the, um, the lowest width of the existing bridge, so the bankful width in this area was uh, um, the least width, you know, keeping the, the bridge to the minimum um, span possible. Um, we didn't want to bring it any closer to the existing bridge because um, it, it causes issues with construction. We don't want to be undermining the existing bridge or needing anything to retain the existing bridge with excavation. Uh, but I understand also that um, the grading in this area, it, it didn't quite work when the path was a little uh, closer. It would have been a steeper walkway and, and uh, we wouldn't have been able to consider it a path, um, which, is, uh, which it currently is, so it doesn't need the, the railings as far as I know. Um, and I, the landscape architect can correct me if I'm wrong there, but um, I believe we we ended up on this location just um, for those those few reasons, um, and that's that's kind of how it um, was laid out, and we we can kept going from there. So um, I go back to cooperate with Yes. Uh, so our our this is our elevation view of the profile of the bridge. Um, like I said here, the, the roadway and the sidewalk is on the right side of your page here. Um, we have um, the existing um, water elevations here shown, uh, the blue shows the approximate normal water elevation. Uh, we have the, uh, the high water elevation throughout the year is roughly at uh, 35.0. So that's, that's roughly what you'll see every year. And then the, the flood elevation that we were given in the hydraulic study was up near um, 36.5, which we don't have shown on here, but um, the low court of our bridge is uh, 36.5, or sorry, the, the flood elevation was 36.0. Um, our low court was 36.5. Um, so that provided a little bit of uh, clearance between the, uh, I believe it was 100 year flood elevation and uh, the low court of our bridge. Um, so based on that, based on um, the existing grades in the area and how high the um, the flood elevation was compared to those grades, uh, we chose to do a um, a, a through truss type uh, deck, meaning that that the supporting structure would be a truss on either side of the the pathway, um, and that just provided the the least. Um, vertical profile between the, the low cord and the, the deck elevation, um, meaning that we could, you know, get the, the deck as, as low, as close to the, the flood elevation as possible without having to raise it up um, so that we didn't have to put in uh, much longer ramps uh, or much larger footings or anything like that. So the idea was to keep everything as, as low profile as possible. So that's um, basically why we came away with this, this section that we came away with. Um, it, overall, it's about a 35 foot long um, deck for this particular area, um, about seven feet wide um, to allow for, you know, railings and everything like that and keep about a, a six and a half foot uh, pedestrian, um, pedestrian way. Um, we're um, anticipating, you know, concrete uh, cast in place footings, shallow footings um, in this area. Um, but uh, minimal, minimal, you know, grading requirements, with the exception of, uh, with the exception of having to, um, you know, maybe grade this area here to to provide the um, the, the ramp down to the, the sidewalk and and also make this this path work here. Um, so, like I said, as minimal impact to the to the resource areas as, as we could we could fit. Um, to give you an idea of what the bridge might look like. Again, these are just kind of preliminary ideas um, that we picked for um, basically constructability and, and minimal, minimum cost. Um, we are, are planning to do this as a prefabricated um, truss bridge, like I said. So a fabricator would basically build the entire thing off site, design it and build it and, and um, uh, deliver it uh, to the site. And it would be kind of dropped into the foundations that we, we laid out. Um, uh, so what I have shown here is a just typically referred to as a, a trail bridge, um, a pretty simple truss bridge on either side with a, a steel truss with timber deck. Um, these are um, just a couple images that we have of an existing uh, bridge. That, again, this is what we were imagining, but certainly open to um, uh, any input you feel about the, the types of materials of the bridge. Um, 
so this in particular, this is a weathering steel bridge. Uh, it means it isn't coated or painted or galvanized or anything like that. It's a special type of steel that just uh, weathers and creates a nice hard protective coating. Um, it, generally good aesthetic for, um, you know, wooded areas like that. Um, and then a timber, a pressure treated timber deck on top of it, um, which is, you know, fairly low maintenance, um, good drainage, um, uh, and, you know, uh, pretty easy um, to cross and, and to maintain. So when the, when the timbers, um, you know, need to be replaced, they can be replaced. Um, I, we share, I, I, again, this is what we were initially envisioning. I shared some other photos here of uh, similar types of bridges, um, just to kind of give some input in what, what other options are available. Um, here we have, uh, like, this would be a galvanized bridge. Uh, so it's rather than the, the weathered steel, which kind of has a the brownish coating, this is just a, your standard galvanizing. This has a bit of an arch to it. Um, I don't anticipate that's gonna be the final condition. We're showing it as a completely level bridge. Uh, generally, because that's the you know, the, the easiest uh, amount of access, um, uh, you don't want to slope on the bridge. Uh, you know, people like the arch for aesthetics, but generally not great for um, accessibility. Um, but again, this is a timber deck. Um, over here, we have something with it's a it's a coated uh, painted steel arch or steel truss. Sorry, uh, this has a concrete deck. Um, a concrete deck. Um, is a little easier to maintain. There's there's little maintenance to it. Uh, you don't have the good drainage through the deck like uh, the timber deck would. Uh, so you know you could get some issues with water retention on the top of it, but um, generally pretty easy to clear and maintain. Um, and then um, there was initial talks of a, a timber uh, structure, which again looked very nice. Again, this this has shows an arch because it was a good example, but wouldn't necessarily have an arch to it. Um, the issue with that type of thing is that um, where a steel bridge has the truss structure, which again is the resisting member, um, it can be nice and you know thick and the deck can be down low at the bottom. Uh, a timber bridge like this, the deck is on top of the you know supporting members. So you have a uh, support, a much, much higher profile, much higher clearance. So the ramps and everything would be need to be raised up a little higher to get over. So again, we want to avoid something like this just because of how much um, taller the you know supporting approaches would need to be, um, and how much more impact that would have to the area. Um, and again, just uh, another um, this is kind of a rendered example of of what we were imagining in the um, in the field. So um, happy to answer any any other questions. Again, this is uh, we were kind of brought on. Um, a little later in the project here to, to provide uh, provide this. We're happy to, to get any feedback or thoughts on, on you know the type of materials that you're interested in, in seeing. Here we have Chris and then Mark. Chris, sure. Um, Matthew, thanks for the presentation. Um, mm -hmm. Just on that latter point, you know the, the the only example that I think we have in town similar to this um, is by a recreational field, and it is it is a timber bridge with that glue lamb support like you described, and I I think. Sure. Your presentation is uh, is really clear Sorry. that um, yeah that's sort of the, yeah. <laughs> my my uh, VDI just signed out on me. I apologize. <laughs> so I just lost uh, they must be doing maintenance on it. I apologize. Well, um, sorry. Keep going with your thought. I'm going to no, stop sharing. No, and that's I, all right. I, I, I was just back up and running. I'll I'll get it going again. No, that's okay. Um, no, I was just going to say I, I I think your presentation makes really clear that if we if we were relying on you know glue lamb to support the deck we we have an even greater grade challenge than we already have right now. I think the core ten steel solution um, is really appealing uh, just given the the environment and and the you know the color that comes from that. Um, this is Winchester, so inevitably dpw will probably get snarky emails from people saying it's time to paint the bridge but uh <laughs> we can maybe put a little sign and say no it's supposed to look that way it's i think intended it, to look like that, yeah. I, I i think it's i think it's fantastic i i think it's a i think it's a very uh, smart material choice um just aesthetically as well as for you know long term um the only question i had was uh so the your bottom of bridge is at 36.5 do we know where the bottom of the, the the vehicular bridge just south, I think, is precast? Um, do do you know what the bottom elevation is of that bridge? And is that meaningful in any way to you and your colleagues at Niche in terms of how you engage with ConCom? Because it seems to me 
you're, you're only barely up river, so to speak. We, we have an yeah. obstruction existing today. It has an elevation and we did mm -hmm. a lot of bridge work there, gosh, like eight years ago, I think, Meg. So, I mean, we have that information, but I'm just curious, your 36.5 falls where relative to that bridge that exists today? That's a very good question. I think the, uh, I think that the bridge that's there today is a little bit lower. The low cord on that bridge is a little bit lower. I'm pretty sure that the elevations of the deck are very similar. Um, and again, we, we, um, we can look into that. Uh, we, I haven't actually done that because we were, you know, pulling this all together sure. um, quickly and focusing on this bridge, but, um, and using the hydraulic information we have for, for this bridge, but I, just based on what I know about the site and, and looking at that other bridge, I'm, I'm almost positive that the deck elevations are about the same and the low cord on that bridge is um, slightly lower than this bridge. It would be a, a, a thicker profile bridge. Um, so there, the, the low cord on that is going to be down in the uh, floodplain. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Again, I don't want to um, yeah. commit to anything without, without getting the proper information, but I'm, I'm almost positive that's the case. Um, and the only thing I would say to that is that we generally don't, we don't generally don't use nearby bridges as, um, uh, you know, guidelines for what we, where we should be doing it. Uh, and, uh, you know, a hydraulic study was performed for this particular sure. stream and we were, you know, provided with flood elevations and we want to try and meet those flood elevations. And, you know, the stream crossing standards, the, the new stream crossing standards require uh, generally 1.2 times the bankful width. And the, so the bankful width here is around 35. Um, so we, we set the uh, abutments back, you know, um, enough to reach the, the 1 1.5, 1 1.2 times that, uh, the width of that, you know, bankful width. Um, so yeah, a lot of it, again, so I guess to answer your question, this was, it was basically set based on the, the, the height and the, the width were set based on the hydraulic information that we were given based on the study for this stream, um, separate from any information we had about the existing bridge. We didn't take any, um, okay. any yeah. And so you know, just to be clear, I'm not, I'm not suggesting yeah. your, your methodology was flawed. I sure. guess I'm, I'm just asking because if we have that information and I'm mm -hmm. like 90% sure we do, I'm sure it's yeah, useful yeah. for us to give you that information because yeah, it yeah. seems to me all things being equal when you're going through CONCOM, you would rather have the bottom cord of your bridge, given that it's up river, you'd rather it be at a higher elevation than the existing sure. bridge, than the lower, just presume, e e even though your methodology is what it is, because it seems to me people will yeah. ask questions like we're, we're creating an sure. obstruction. Why are we doing that? No. Okay. And I can, I can, yeah, I can say, you know, almost, you know, I, I can't imagine that the flood elevation would have Know, gone down and since that bridge was done and I'm, I'm i'm sure that you know that bridge was done so i'm i'm almost positive that our elevation is higher than that i would i would okay. i would uh, bet money that it is so and, and um, we've been doing we've been yeah. doing flood mitigation projects in winchester yeah. one after the other for the past like 18 years and we just funded gotcha. the last one last year and um, once that project is done we're doing a complete fema remapping of winchester but mm -hmm. we we haven't done one in a long 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 time um gotcha but we, we can we certainly can get that information to you if, if it's helpful for the permitting I process. Believe, but I, I think believe it's very it's, elegant. It's, it's available to me. I, I just haven't actually gotten into digging into it yet. Okay. I believe Weston Sampson, who is the who did the hydraulic study and who did the uh, is doing the geotech for this um, this you know the bridge uh, is the one that, that worked on that bridge. If I'm not um, if I'm not okay. correct. So, um, well, yeah, I, I will certainly. Yeah, I appreciate the the advice. We. Well, we'll definitely make sure that we're in in accordance. You know, we're similar at least uh, to that other bridge if if it isn't already. And um, yeah, that's a very good point. Great. All right. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Matthew, thanks for the presentation. I, I'm going to concur with Chris that the weathering steel and pressure treated is a great combination of materials in the right balance of value, maintenance, and mm -hmm. aesthetics. For the project, I had two quick things. Uh, one is something I have noticed on trail bridges as one potential drawback of the pressure treated is sometimes it can become slippery, especially mm -hmm. when it's been used a lot, it starts to get that kind of shine to it. So just considering like a nonstick coating, though I understand that that also doesn't always last, um, maybe something worth considering uh, on the walking surface 
And the second thing is if you go back to page two, uh, I may be imagining it, but if you zoom in on the bridge, looks like there's an artfully placed green polygon just east of the bridge, which looks like it aligns perfectly with the crosswalk and potentially was at one point a stair that went from the, the crosswalk elevation to the bridge. And I guess one was, is that the case? And two, is there a reason that it was taken out if it was the case, because it does seem like that's a desire line that will be fulfilled regardless of whether there is a stair there now or not. So I, I believe that the idea is to put something there to prevent that desire line, whether it be a wall or a plaque or, or something, a railing. Um, but I think I might defer to maybe Charlie or David um, as to the reason maybe why the ramp was chosen um, in the configuration that it was. You, you can probably blame me for talking about, <laughs> talking you out of it. Um, Mitch originally showed a set of stairs there and <clears throat> it does seem to be a natural desire line, I agree. Um, there were two reasons why we were suggesting that it, uh, that, that we not put stairs there because during inclement weather, it's another place to maintain and make sure that they're not slippery or um, so for sh shoveling, snow removal, de-icing. Um, and also just thinking about um, the common path of travel that everybody takes as the most inclusive solution. Um, even though the ramp is taking you a little bit out of your way, um, if we could, as Matt was alluding to there, um, as you're approaching it from the crosswalk, you're looking at this signage that tells you about this wonderful resource area and a little story about the brook and the bridge or something. And then you take a little turn and you go around the corner to cross the bridge. Um, I don't know, it seems like it could be fun for kids and it's not too inconveniencing, but those are the reasons why we were thinking it was first more about safety and maintenance. And secondarily, it was more about, hey, this would be more inclusive too, rather than forcing people in wheel wheelchairs to go around, yep. everybody goes around. I don't know if, you, if that logic rings true to your community, but. No, it's great, thanks. Isa? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I asked the question, David, um, have you been up there at the site and standing on the bridge? And would you say the brook, maybe it's a question to you and it just wanted to ask, um, would you say is the brook is flowing naturally or is it kind of the way it looks sort of backed up on the um, north side of the existing bridge? Uh, what, what are your thoughts? The reason I'm asking is, um, all right, so, you know, knowing how the site is flowing, um, uh, draining now, and if you just go and stand, or if you have a picture of the existing, how it looks to the north of the existing bridge and south of the existing bridge, uh, what are your thoughts, maybe to both of you guys and each and you, is the brook is flowing naturally and and doing getting into that area to do this work do we need to think something else to take that into consideration uh when we are providing improvements so how would you answer that question um i i would say that yeah um again with with the bankful width requirements we're required to build the abutments outside of the banks of the um, the normal high flood elevation. So any work, any excavation that's done to to build the abutments would be done, you know, in the banks rather than in, you know, outside of the banks rather than in the in the stream. So we wouldn't be disturbing the natural flow. Um, there may need to be some supportive excavation um, in order to excavate that closely without um, disturbing the the pond. And I believe the estimates included some allowance for. Um, that supportive excavation and, and dewatering um, that would be in, involved in that. Um, another option would be deep foundations, so some sort of driven foundation, um, whether it's micro piles or uh, uh, a drilled shaft. Um, generally, much more expensive. Um, so, um, uh, let me phrase so, this question again. Yeah. Are you taking into consideration there may be future flood mitigation improvement to Stony uh, Hornburn Brook? And then having that in mind, 
are you coming up with the foundation scheme for the pedestrian bridge? In other words, being completely outside, yeah. but taking into that room. Um, that, yeah. you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. There was, there was a hydraulic study performed on the, the, um, the pond. We, they examined, um, you know, all the different flood elevations, uh, both now and, you know, I believe a hundred years from now, the anticipated flood elevations, um, at that time, um, and all that was, you know, compiled and consolidated and, um, um, flood elevation, uh, design flood elevation was, you know, recommended for the bridge. So, uh, and that was all taken into consideration when we designed, again, like I said, the, the, the low court of the bridge, the, the width of the bridge to stay outside of the banks, all of that was, was designed. So yes, we, we, we took all that consideration into, um, you know, what, what this, this stream may become now, you know, in the future, um, the maximum floods that, that may occur here, um, like I, I will say like the 250 year flood probably isn't a reasonable, um, so uh, is the harbor you, uh, flowing naturally? Like if you have a picture of how it's looking now, I'm yeah. just not to you, but I'm just asking because I just have the deep down concern. Um, like if I go and stand up on the bridge and to me, to the visual eye, it's looking like is the north side of the bridge, um, you know, sort of, a a high level standing water and if you look to the south it's a pretty low why is that it's just asking from the visual uh-huh i i uh, i have i can't answer that i have no idea i have no you know i like as i said i, I haven't really studied the existing bridge there i don't know what the, no, no, the, the brook uh, so anyway because i'm just i, I don't know I, yeah I, I i don't really I, I don't know exactly the the bed of the existing um stream the in that brook. area and how that how that uh, how that flows um I, I guess i i would say it flows naturally i don't know if there's any um obstructions in the stream that may be causing that or a dam you know whether man-made or or um you know critter made i i i guess i can't say for sure i can look into it but i i will say that this bridge will not have any impact on the natural flow of the river I, like like i said we um we're placing everything outside of of banks above flood elevations, uh, not impacting the stream, the existing stream bed, at least for this particular, um, this particular bridge here. So, um, I, I can say with certainty that this won't impact the natural flow of what's existing currently. So what permits this would trigger? Because, um, you know, um, when you look at the buffer zone, oh, let's see, where are the lines you have, like how far that you would come outside? Uh-huh. So is it other than NOI, it's not triggering anything else? Um, I, I will have to look a little closer into that. I again I haven't um I haven't dug too deep into that. Permitting is not my area of expertise. And you know, we all have a team that's looking at. I know an NOI will will be required. We've talked about that. I don't believe this is a navigable waterway, so I don't know if um um that needs to be done. Potentially Army Corps of Engineer, um uh um, may need a permit there. Um, but, yeah. So maybe it's a question to Charlie, but at what point, Charlie, this will all be like connected together to think whether it's feasible or not, just asking, you know, not just the cost, because I think the end of the day, permitting would dictate and to put things in perspective, you know, if it's going to be a, just asking, you know, like. A, well, I presume we're going to permit it at the same time we permit the rest of the project. I, yeah, I, I wouldn't say there'd be any issue. I mean, we've we've designed plenty of, of bridges like this in similar situations and similar. Um, I, I believe everything that we've proposed is done within the performance standards of the Wetland Protection Act. Um, it would be up to the CONCOM to you know condition it as as they typically do. But um, it's the same thing with Army Corps. I don't believe there's any um, there would be any issue permitting permitting wise with getting what we're proposing permitted. I mean, it's going to be permitted as a single project, not as separate projects. Right, right. Not that was the question. What other additional permitting a permit those would trigger? That was the question. And obviously, you know, it's a single project, but maybe this would say require other than NOI. That was the question. You know, do we know? Uh, I defer to uh, Michelle. 
Yes, I think it might, we were just starting to look at that. Um, again, it was a late add to the product. So I think it might, we are looking at the Army Corps triggers, but again, we've worked with our structural department yeah. a lot on permitting bridges like this. So I'm not anticipating any issues with getting it permitted. We just have to go through and see what the exact trigger is and what would need to be filed. Right, yeah, we would, again, yeah, we would go through all the, the requirements, find the, the the permits that are required, but but like, like Michelle said, we've done, Permits. We've worked with the Army Corps. We've worked with Chapter 91. We've worked with plenty of uh, conservation commissions, and um, I, I don't anticipate any, um, you know, any, and you know, maybe some additional requirements from those permits, but nothing that would would you know um, change the design considerably or even you know prevent this from being constructed. As far as as far as I'm aware. Time wise, yeah, that was the question. No, I'll just add. So we've had preliminary talks with the Conservation Commission. Um, they haven't, the latest that we just um, sent to them did show this bridge. This wasn't in the, the first round. So we've been having talks with them. So if there's anything that comes up with that, I'm sure they'll let us know what they want to see and how we can kind of work together to make sure that they're happy with the design we're showing. Yeah, all right. Um, thank you. David, do you have something to add? Yeah, was just just to be able to answer Keith, this question as far as what's underneath uh, the bridge, I do have a picture from October of 2021. Um, I don't know if Matt, you don't mind. Stop, there we go. I can share my screen. Um, just because the question is asked, I want to see if we can answer it. Uh, it's not my area of expertise, but um, this picture here uh, does appear to show the water level on both sides of the bridge being at a static. I mean, it's flowing, but it's at the same level. And if there is, if over time it's higher on the upstream side than the downstream side, it, it seems like it's more of a maintenance issue in my opinion, but that's the extent of <laughs> what I'm okay. willing to comment on it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks, <laughs> because yeah. I didn't take a picture that day, but it's how looked to me on that visual observation. It's like, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and that's the stream itself. So I'll stop sharing. But... Okay. Thank you. Uh, any final questions before we move on? No? Um, I would just like to thank Warren Larson and Niche for their presentations and let them go. Okay. Thank you, okay. thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks, Thanks very guys. much. Nice right. job. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> okay, that was very nice. Moving on, we're not far off from schedule. Uh, payments authorizations that was just sent out before the meeting. Okay, so there's <clears throat> quite a few this week. Um, let me go over the payment authorizations first. So there's Triumphs uh, application number two. Uh, we have two invoices for uh where are we now february and march from hill international one invoice for tape for february um we have an accent printing they're our plan holder uh they distribute the plans um and then an invoice uh from for vhb for their work on the well field so if i could get approval of all of those if there's any questions let me know if there's no questions, I'm happy to make a motion to approve the uh, six payment authorizations as presented by Meg White. Second. 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 Okay. Thank you, Gita. Frank? Aye. Yes. Lisa? Uh, yes. Vivian, do you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that the two invoices for Hill International, the first one, number 20, is for January, and number 21 is for February. I just didn't want you guys to think that we were ahead of the month. The month of March hasn't ended yet, so that's all. Thank you. Just a point of clarification. Todd? Yes. Uh, Geetha seconds myself. Uh, John? Still on. I think we no, we lost John. No, exactly. Yeah, Colleen. Aye. Chris, we have uh, Mark. Aye. Don. Approve. And Emily. Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
I'll pull that back up, Meg. Yeah, move on to the second half. <clears throat> so we have three spending authorizations. The first is the invoice from Eversource for the um, electric service to the modulars, um, 67,692. Um, the second one, so <clears throat> the second one is a proposal from Hill International to provide clerking services for the modular um, project to have someone out there on a weekly basis uh, looking at the site at the site work mostly my biggest concern is the infiltration system that's getting installed so Hill working together with Vivian put together a proposal for thirty thousand eight hundred dollars for those services and let me look for my thing it's between now it would start April 1st and it would go through um, September 1st mm -hmm. um, at about it's, $400 a week. Um, it's about, we're anticipating about eight hours um, a week yep. of site visits and site oversight. It wouldn't be a full-time clerk. It would just be um, yeah. on a weekly basis to provide, you know, check-ins to make sure that the work is progressing as it's supposed to do a little bit of daily reports of what we are seeing as well as be there for any inspectional opportunities. And it was um, anticipating about an hour a week, maybe sometimes a little bit more to uh, an hour and a half a few days. So not to exceed an eight hour time frame for week for that duration. Mike, you had a question? Yeah, two questions. Uh, one, just to clarify, you're saying an hour or so each day? A day. Every, every day. Okay, thank you. And that probably answers my second question, which is, What's the, the current obligation of the design team to make periodic site visits to observe progress, if any? So this is design build, so it's a little bit different, right? It's like Charlie's scope sort of doesn't exist on this in the way it's we ended. typically yep. think, right? Although we did, we did, we we are happy to go out there. I mean, we did anticipate some um just the ability to clarify RFIs, we're expecting to do as needed. Um, we're happy to visit the site as required with their questions, and but we're not, you know, we're not stamping drawings, we're not signing requisitions, we're not really, you know, the, the quote unquote architect of record. But we we have totally fine doing whatever we need to do. I mean, I do expect some, you know, we'll do whatever we need to do to get the job done. We're not going to refuse and, to do anything <laughs> unless it's unreasonable. <laughs> and Meg, yeah. this is, is your like, recommendation that we proceed with uh, this partial clerking service? Oh, I, I was not really consulted on it, but I think it's fine. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I was asking Meg. Oh, okay. I apologize because I was talking over you, so I didn't hear the first part of your question. Can you ask me that again? Yeah, I was just saying, is it your recommendation that we proceed with this? Yes, absolutely. I, this is coming in large part from uh, town staff who is very aware of the project and is very concerned about it, you know, that it all goes smoothly and they don't have the time to be out there inspecting um, the, the utility work and it's really important that it does get done correctly. So, Excellent. Thank in you. the past, Mark, we've always had hired someone to help out on these yep. smaller projects. Sometimes yeah. we were able to get the building inspector to, or the assistant building inspector, but we weren't, this is just a little too much going on right now yep. for everyone. Chris? Uh, just a clarification, Vivian, for the 30,800, we're getting some sort of weekly field report, I assume? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. We, we also get one from uh, Triumph as well. And, you know, it's, it's so it's good. It'll be good to see both. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you want somebody out there. And so it's in the owner's best interest at all times, you know. This isn't an extensive clerk service. It's just right. for an hour a day, you know, um, if needed an hour and a half, just to make sure that we have visibility on any testings or any installation. So Meg, just, are you looking for a motion? Do you want a motion and a vote on the I have a question two, on that do, next one. Do, you, do you, you want to get through the presentation on the third one next anyway? 
Should um, I ask a question? Um, sure. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, good question, um, Meg. So, the third one, right? I guess the MIFA in a big picture. I guess they are going to file it, right? So what are you looking in a big picture? Okay, the MEPA, let's say the permit comes back, it would have A, B, C, D, and D to be implemented. So how are you thinking? <coughs> in a, um, a I'm not expecting uh -huh. any uh, requirements from MEPA. This was a land transfer requirement. That, uh, they're going to say how they're going to, um, you know, um, how do I phrase it? When they are filing the MEPA, they're going to say um, they're going to grout the wells, correct? Is that what they're going to say? I doubt it, but you, I mean, you never know, never say never, but I believe what they would do is require us because again, the issue that trans the issue that triggered the MEPA review was the transfer of land. You want to get the salad stuff correct. out? So I think what they were requiring um, is that we remove it from um, uh, Article 97. Yeah, now, that has already happened, and they know that, but they're still making us go through this process. So I don't suspect that they would ask us to do anything, but if they asked us to fill and grout the wells, then but that's not the, their concern is not the wells is not the well field, but um. We'll see. And if they require that, then we'll have to include it in the contract. But it wouldn't have to be necessarily, uh, all the wells would not necessarily have to be included in this contract because the school isn't on top of all those wells. And we'll certainly find them when we excavate. So um, it's a long way of saying to be determined. I don't think that will be a requirement, but uh, I, I, I'm really shocked that we have to go through this process. Um, but you know, what are you going to do? We no. we fought really hard to not have to do this. Not expected, that's for sure. But yeah, we got a lot. Of, we got a lot of heavy hitters involved in this, and it didn't. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't pan out. So. Yeah, but I thought, Meg, pardon me, I was in shock with the letter from DUP, correct, directly said it has to be grounded, so per se, just because of the transfer or whatever. So I thought there's no outage. Uh -huh. yeah, that was only a recommendation from DUP. Right, 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 in the recommendation, but just because the language, I implement, I read it as that way. So that's why I was asking, um, what are we thinking in a big picture? Um, uh, so Yeah, I don't know yet. Okay. Oh, yeah, I don't know yet. So Meg, okay. I, I brought this up on screen. I, I was trying, what I was trying to say earlier was, do we need to act on the first two, just not knowing how much time it would take for presentations or questions here. But since Gita's asked the question, do you, uh, anything you want to say about sort of the cost here? I mean, I, I did see some things in the BHB proposal that are rolled into the 160 and it says it's if it's required. So that's sort of an upset limit, right? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, this is, it's very expensive. There's no doubt about it. It's pure labor costs. Um, there's a lot of documentation, as you can see, that needs to go into this. And it's a really pretty compressed time schedule that we're trying to meet so that we get approval by August. Um, if we don't, I mean, they'll bill for the work they do. If they don't do it, then we'll close out the contract and close the purchase order and the money will go back into the account. So. Um, hopefully some of those documents that they think are, are suggesting might not be required. Hopefully that's the case and we can save some money. And they have a schedule and, is, and we'll, we'll put this on the project drive for everybody to look at. This is like a, what, 10 or 11 page proposal. So there's a lot of detail here. Yeah, yeah it's um, that schedule is dictated by uh, MEPA and hopefully, you know, we need to get it. I want to get them approval tomorrow so that we can meet that March. March um, target. Right. I'm ready okay. to make the motion, Chris. <laughs> All right. Let me hold on. Let me just pull it back up. Just just a minute. Just so everybody can see it. I was a little slow okay. jumping from one screen to the other, Gita. Okay, I got it. There you go. You see that? Yeah. 
how do I say to my English? I make the motion to this are dated. I can't see it, Chris. Today is the date. It's okay, the payment. Make the motion to approve the payment authorization and the spending. Well, we did that. We did the payment author. Yeah. We did payment oh, okay, already. Okay, sorry. The spending authorization as listed here by FSOs Hill and BHP for the amount as shown. Second. Thank you, Brian. Okay, Frank. Aye. Lisa. Yes. Todd. Aye. My son, uh, John is gone. Colleen? Aye. Chris? Aye. Mark? Aye. Don? Aye. And Emily? Yep. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Okay, moving on. Um, just one quick thing, Jay. <clears throat> With the pedestrian bridge, I do think we would be required to get a Chapter 91 license, so just... If you tell me, Meg, I have heard so many embankments, you know, NOI, and I, I'm not a permit specialist. Yes, I've heard Chapter 91. <clears throat> it so Definitely don't... Chapter 91. It's gone over yeah. a while. Yes, yeah. it's, sometimes it's so hard to fight for 91. You name it. You just have to... Your hands 91, it, the biggest thing with 91 is the time frame. It, it's yes. Been nine to 12 months to get a wow. chapter. Yes. So, um, well, better get started now then. Yeah. <laughs> you mean over time? <laughs> we could have a, we could have a groundbreaking for the school and a groundbreaking for the bridge, and then we could take bets on which one ends it. first. <laughs> yeah, but you don't, I mean, the thing is too, you don't have to, that bridge does not have to be in place to open the school, right? I mean, if we, if we know, <laughs> You know, it's it wouldn't hold up the school. You know, but then two contractors tell me about it, Meg. All right, we do it all the time, <laughs> all the time. Okay. Okay. Anyway, it could be the same contractor. They just have a different schedule for the yeah. bridge. We do that all the time too. So that's very the site contractor can own it, and when the permit, you mean? Yeah, yeah. You just have to do it when the permit allows it. Yeah, and the good thing is it could be being made off site, like they said. Right. So we're not waiting to do it. You know, it could be done ready. For yeah, the you get the footings in, and yeah. you might also have the, a the, the tri community. Or... The tri community bikeway is a bridge very similar to this. I think it's Galvey though, um, and it's right there, off of behind Montvale Avenue. Um, yeah. Showed up on a big, big flatbed truck. They came and they just dropped it down. Yep. Yeah. Can we do a little maintenance to the brook, Mayor? I don't know to make it no. feel a little better. No, <laughs> no. you want no. You want no. you talk about permits and money. Yeah. You want to dredge. Dredging is the most permit heavy process there is. Yeah. So no. <laughs> I want to see some fish floating down. It looks so. I think it could. It, hopefully, it'll get better when the there's not street sheet drainage coming off the parking lot any longer. You know. Oh, but, yeah. It, it would have to be dredged, and that is very uh, uh, yeah. expensive yeah. Um, permit. Yeah. Yeah. Next project. We'll yeah. put it in the next project. All right, next meeting dates. We're going to add one for 327 um, if we have a quorum. So it's yeah, going to so be the community. I'll, I'll, post, I'll, post that. I'll post it, Jay, but just it, it it's not like mandatory, but but it will post it in case in case everybody wants to come. Right. So uh, Chris and Jay and Frank, we should get um, notices out to the residents somehow. I mean, if we just say we're going to have it, then we want it's really the neighbors that we want to attend this meeting. Yep. So we should get some type of mailer out or something uh, i'm not going to deliver with... to their houses i'll tell you that i'm not going to take my <laughs> life in my own hands meg can you work with mark too good and his magical abutters list um to get it's something? not mark Tugood's list it would be the assessor's list but yes i could get an assessor's list if someone wants to draft something i can get it mailed out yeah just a little notice is um, there enough time handling. to do that and have a mailer and expect them to get it and attend a Monday night meeting one week from today. I could have an I could have an agenda done tomorrow. Yeah, I do think so. I I've had uh, several conversations with several of the neighbors um, on this the past couple of days, and um, 
I think they'd be very eager and uh, very much looking forward to um, something like this. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and we could, you know, maybe Frank could push out something on Parent Square. I could put something out on Twitter. I'll update the um, the project website has been updated, by the way. We haven't looked at it as, in a while as a committee, but uh, yeah, I could put something on there too. These <laughs> people we're we're going to record it too, right? Yeah. yeah. Idea. Yes. Well, yeah. yeah, we could let, let Win, I'll give WinCam the link and they can help us out with that. Sure. Um, I'm the one. So then, Jay, that we're, we're adding that meeting, and then everybody see the note there that uh, that there has been some legislation filed that would extend our uh, remote meeting allowance until 2025. However, that's not standalone. That's been tethered with um, some other stuff and some spending authorizations. And so that I don't, I don't know. Maybe it's in committee right now. So that meeting on April 10th is an important one for the Parkhurst Award for Charlie's scope. Um, so if, if nothing happens on Beacon Hill, we should assume we're meeting at Parkhurst to award the Parkhurst work. Great. Okay. Is there a time for the meeting on the 27th? Six o'clock. Yeah. Okay, th thank, thank you. Yeah. Standard time. Yep. And Jay, you were hoping to sort of keep it to like an hour? I would think so. Yeah. But I don't know how it's going to go. I really can't tell. Oh, but. we have the questions from them, Meg, or no? Just uh, open for them. To... Um. Yeah. I mean, their biggest concern is well, one, what is going on? They, you know, and two, is this permanent? They, you know, there, there is, a, um, I think, some misinformation out there that it was permanent. Um. And, uh, you know, con some concerns with drainage, uh, concerns with traffic, yeah. concerns with, um, you know, kind of digging up their newly paved road for okay. um, some, you know, some of the electric and water, not, not electric, I posit, uh, it's water, water and sewer line. Yeah. Um, so that's really you know, mostly I just really, actually they're probably their biggest concern is the loss of the playing field. So, which I, you know, reiterated is, is just temporary. Right. So all, all reasonable questions. Yes. Yep. yep. And we, we intended to do so. It's just, we got a company that's right on schedule showing up out there. I know. Yeah, I mean, it'll be fine. There's yeah. <clears throat> nobody was angry, you know. So, Chris, if you can send me that tomorrow, I will get something sent out in the mail. Tomorrow's Tuesday. You know, they'll get it by Thursday. Okay. And it's just going to be very generic. It's just going to be, you know, swing space uh, presentation by Tape and Hill International. Um, and then Q&A with the EFPBC and engineering and planning. Um, maybe just a, I don't imagine it's more than 10, 10 minute presentation and we can leave it open for Q&A. Yep. So will you include, um, are you going to create a Zoom link and put it in there? Andrew is going to help me with the link and I will put it in there, yes. Okay, great. All right. Motion to close. So moved, 8.15. All right. Frank. Good meeting, everybody. Thank you. Good. Good. Oh, do I? Okay. Lisa. Yeah, I. Sorry, guys. <laughs> All right. Brian. Yes. Todd. Hi. Geetha. Hi. Don. Colleen. Hi. Mark. Hi. And Don left already. Emily. Hi. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Nice meeting. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.